to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August 18th, 2024. The title of this lesson and board's commentary, as well as Towson Express International Sunday School commentary is Upright and Godly. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, as well as hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Before we get into our lesson, let's start with the moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for us for giving us your son, O oh Lord, and holding us accountable to live upright and holy. For your word said, be holy, for you are holy. Lord, we love you, we honor, and praise your name. And it's your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture be coming from Titus chapter one, verses one through 13, as well as chapter two, verses 11 through 15. And we'll be in the new King James version of the Bible today. Now, our main thought will come from Titus chapter one, verse 11 and 13, which says, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Creatures are always liars, even beasts, and gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little background. We're now in the fourth quarter in the new unit titled Eternal Hope. We're in the 12th lesson of this um, particular quarter, and this week's lesson is coming from the book of Titus. Now, the book of Titus in the Bible was penned by the apostle Paul to the pastor Titus, whom he left behind. As a pastor on the island of Cree, Titus had a huge um, a mission that he had to accomplish. See, this letter is one of Paul's three pastoral epistles the other two were 1 Timothy 1 and 2, which offer guidance to young believers who care for large groups of people. This letter is considered to have been written um, in the last part of the first century or early in the second century. Now, this letter, Paul encouraged Titus to, to lead the church he established on that island and to transform the Christian culture from, one, um, from within through the good news of Jesus Christ. So in this letter, Paul emphasized the importance of selecting church elders carefully and instructing Titus to hold the family meeting to put the church in order. Paul also urged the Christian believers to reject a lifestyle inconsistent with the love of God and to participate moreover in promoting the gospel of Christ for the common good of the hour. This lever covers three topics and is broken across the, the chapters, as we know, of three chapters. Chapter one discussed the qualifications of church leaders. Chapters two and three um, talks about how believers should live among each other in a community uh, or in the body of Christ. The letter also expressed concerns about leadership in the early church and assumed that good order and teaching and people and the conduct would spread the gospel to everyone. So while the details of the message are specific to Titus and the believers there in Cree, they are also offer insight to us today that can be very very useful. And this is where our lesson picks up in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, which says, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness. Paul begins this letter, of course, with his name, which he's well known. Each of his epistles, we, he started off with his name. Now, the one that does not start off his name, where people debate, was it Paul, was it someone else, is the book of Hebrews, because it's not introduced the way Paul normally introduced his epistles. So that's why there's a question mark on who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, in this book, Paul gives two descriptions of his God-given roles. 
One, he's a slave to God. And two, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, th this is the only place where Paul used the expression bond servant of God. The idea is Paul is being a, a slave to God is, is unique and found nowhere else in the New Testament. He calls himself a servant of Jesus, but a slave to God, which is very interesting. Now, the second way Paul describes himself is as an apostle. An apostle is the highest rank of any role in Christianity, is a title of great authority, because the word apostle means sent one. It carries the idea of an ambassador. An apostle um, had the right to, to find, uh, the, the, they found the church and, and they wrote scripture. So Paul had a right to write the epistle of Titus, Titus a, a, as the word of God because he was appointed to do so by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we all know about the road to Damascus. Now, God dispatched one um, quite like Paul um, to do a unique service. See, Paul served God with this unflagging zeal and determination. He was an outstanding um, expositor of Christianity, especially in the first century. The purpose of Paul's apostleship was to serve the faith of God's elect. That would be us, to bring the, the elect the faith and tell any and everyone about God. His apostleship would nurture their faith, and, and by his written scripture, among other things, we find we know about Paul right now because God used him as a vessel to give us his word. Now, our lesson then moved down to verses two and three, where Paul continued to introduce himself. It reads, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time begun, but has in due time manifest his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. See, this is a life of eternal God living within us. We understand that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Therefore, God lives in us and is present now, but it will be completed. It's present right now, but it will be completed later. This eternal life is not something um, that is wished for, but is hoped. There's a difference. See, in this sense of hope, hope is an anticipation found not by this wishful thinking, but by a promise from God who cannot lie. Paul knew that preaching is the way that God's eternal work actually meet people today. As the Bible tells us that um, faith comes by hearing. And how do people hear the word? It's because the word is preached. See, preaching is a way for God. God's word is made evident or manifest, as Paul mentioned here. Is this preaching was entrusted to Paul and the apostles back then, as well as to us preaching and teaching even to this day. This mission to preach is not optional. See, the end of the verse, Paul notes that is by command of God, our Savior. This mission to preach is, is one that God gives us and he sends us to do this. This is why we're called to preach. We don't volunteer to preach. We're called to do this. And when we accept that, this is, where, is how we fulfill the purpose that God has for us. So Paul tells them back then and us right now that he was commanded by God, our Savior. Now, in verse four, Paul began now to talk about who he's addressing the letter to, Titus. Verse four read, to Titus, a true son of our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, in verse four, the focus shift from Paul to the recipient, Titus, as he is described as, uh, Paul said, he's my true child in common faith. This expressed and likely denotes um, Titus' um, conversion by Paul, signifying this genuine spiritual relationship. This is uh, Titus is one like Timothy, where Paul groomed to be a pastor. Furthermore, it underscored their, their shared faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and emphasized their joint conviction in teaching of God's word. And that is recognizing, like John chapter four, verse six says, recognizing and regarding Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Now in verse five, 
Paul addresses Titus' mission right there in Crete. It reads, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city to uh, as I command you. So after the successful evangelistic campaign in the alley of Crete, where uh, we find that Titus accompanied Paul to do this, there were a lot of young Christians that were there to still take care. Paul's mission continued on, but we find that Paul left Titus behind to, to, um, to build up the church, to establish the church um, with mature, qualified pastors to the people. Now, this was especially needed in Crete because the people in Crete were, were a wild bunch. They were well known to be liars and, and lazy people, as Paula mentioned later in this letter. So Titus had to find and train capable leaders for um, uh, that, that are Christians in that island so he can set the stage. And then moves down to verses six through nine, which Paul is setting out the qualifications that Titus is to choose elders or leaders for the church. It reads, if a man is blameless, a husband to one wife, having faithful children not accused of dispensation or, dis, uh, or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is right, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast to the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exalt and convict those who contradict. See, the overall requirement of an elder, elder we find here is blamelessness. He, he should not, he or she should not be, uh, should, should not leave himself open for accusations or indictments either in the church or the community. No, no one should be able to accuse a Christian leader of, of some um, blame in, that, that he's caused here. And this is so important. We need to understand this even today that as leaders in the church, we're supposed to be beyond reproach. We're supposed to be the ones that set the tone and to show others how to live. So just as um, Paul is telling, telling Titus right now, we need to be aware of this today, that as pastors and teachers and ministers and elders, we, there's more expected of us in the faith. Paul is telling Titus here that the, the um, elders should, should live a life above reproach so he's not open to the criticism of the church. Now, why is that so important? Because we don't want to distract people from getting to know who Christ is. We don't want to take attention away from Christ where people are worrying about, are we doing right? Are we doing what we're supposed to do? No, we want to point them to God and be that reflection that we're pointing to. The qualifications for a biblical leader require three blameless conditions. First of all, it, it requires a man to be blameless in their marriage as well as their family. His per, um, personal character traits should be blameless. And lastly, his commitment to God's word and remaining true to his message must be blameless. And, and here is saying a, a man, uh, a blameless leader has one wife. And now that doesn't mean that a single person cannot lead a church, but it does disqualify someone that's dealing in polygamy and have multiple wives. It says the children of the leader, of the leader should believe. The leader's first ministry is at home. The Bible tells us to raise up our children in the way they should go. If we can't handle our home and making sure our home is on um, the right path, and doing what God requires of us, how can we lead a larger congregation? So um, Paul is pointing this out as well. Now, as we move into verse seven, it moves from the term of elder to the term of bishop. Now, the word bishop means overseer. Bishop is a sing is singular here, and um, elsewhere in the New Testament is a, a singular function where there's only one bishop per congregation, yet there may be many elders. The bishop carries this idea of the official capacity of governing. Now, a pastor bishop here is saying it must be have a good reputation right, um, uh, to lead the congregation effectively. See, a pastor must be a steward of God. So the steward of, um, comes from two words in Greek. It comes from house and law. 
The idea here is to rule the household on behalf of the master or the owner. So stewards were usually slaves or um, slaves who become freemen. And their job was, although they were slaves, they had great authority and they were responsible for the, um, the children's education. They were responsible for household finances. They were responsible for other slaves, as well as the overarching business associated with that family. However, the steward's job was to run the household on behalf of the owner. So the steward didn't own anything. He ran the household on behalf of the owner. And as uh, to be blameless in God, we're running God's house on behalf of the father. It's the father's rules, not ours. It's the father's will and understanding, not that of our own. We will be overseeing that church. The church is God's house and the pastor will be God's steward. And the pastor, therefore, must not be, according to Paul, arrogant and self-interest. The pastor must not be quick-tempered. We find in James chapter 1, verse 19 says, So then, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So we can't be quick-tempered as a pastor. A pastor must not be an alcoholic. Here is saying this, this bishop must not allow the you know, addiction to wine capture them. It, this here is an issue of control. A drunkard should not lead others because they can't even lead themselves. They can't even control their own urges. How can they lead someone else? The next thing Paul mentioned here is they shouldn't be valid. A leader should at least um, be one, it should be the last one, I should say, ready to fight or argue with someone else. Uh, that leader should not be one to want to be the aggressor. We should be resolved in God enough to know who we are and who we belong to and not need to use our hands to prove a point. He goes on to say a, a leader shouldn't be money hungry. As mentioned here, it says greedy for money, which is translated into um, two places, uh, two words in Greek. The um, base and greedy or greed. The person seeking wealth at any cost is what we're talking about here. A Christian leader should not use their position of leadership to profit financially. Now, now don't get me wrong. There, every leader should be able to make money. And this is something that's mentioned in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, as well as, as, well as 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse um, 11. So we should be able to make money, but that should not be our drive where we make a decision that, okay, this make money, so do it. And this doesn't make money, so don't do it. That is not our mission as leaders. So we shouldn't be chasing money. We should be chasing the father. Lastly here, Paul is arguing that the qualification um, it, it, is that this bishop should should uh, be hospitable. So instead of being having this attitude of self-interest and money um, greedy, instead, a leader, the ones that, that Titus is to choose and the ones that should lead us today should be hospitable. Hospitality is an attitude of welcoming and giving to others. This is in strong contrast to, again, being whether it's money hungry or violent or anything like that. He says we should be hospitable. The other thing we should be is lovers of good. A leader must have a virtue of love or love type virtue about them. They should love what God wants and follow what God wants them to be, right? We should want to see the good in people, not look for the bad. The next thing he says, a good leader should be sober-minded. In this case, it can be translated, how we would say today, cool-headed. The leader should be a master of his mind and, and be a sensible person, not blow up at, at the drop of a dime, but be even kiltered. Then Paul says he should be just. A Christian leader um, must commit themselves to doing what is right, doing what is just. This is why we are called to be righteous, and righteous means to be right with God. As leader, we are more so um, required to be righteous. Paul mentioned that a good leader or bishop should be holy. In fact, God said himself, be holy for I am holy. And holy means to be pure and clean and devout. A good leader should have self-control. The idea of self-control means self-discipline. 
This leader is accountable for their actions. They monitor their desires and their choices, and they weigh it against God's desire, choices, and understanding for their life. And in each time a debate come up, whether to do what God says or to do what they want, God win each time because of the self-control that we have to obey God. Then when we find in verse nine, Paul mentioned that um, first an elder must be able to teach God's truth, which is required for um, a, a stable understanding of spiritual things. So th th this is both a spiritual gift as well as a skill that have to be developed. How? We need to know who Christ is. We need to study the word so we can develop and be able to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. But secondly, he's saying that elders should stand firm in order to counter those who contradict the truth. See, Titus is facing many false teachers here, and he and the chosen elder would have to be ready to stand against false teachings while promoting sound doctrine or healthy teaching or telling about who Christ is to those under their care. So standing firm requires both uh, a solid offense. As, as we know, our uh, uh, offense is the gospel, a sword of truth, and, as well as a defense, which we're communing the, communicating the truth of God. We have the shield of faith. And this is so important when we look at this and we look at our leaders right now. We should ask, do our leaders have these characteristics that Paul is telling Titus about? in our lesson today. Next, it moves down to verses 10 through 13, which discuss the tasks that are given to these elders with the qualities that Paul mentioned. It reads, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of circumcisions whose mouths must be stopped, who, who subvert whole household, teaching things what they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own said, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. The, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. See, after Paul emphasized the importance of Christian leaders being immersed in the word of God in order to discern and expose the false leaders that may be there in Crete, he's saying that a pastor must be aware that there will be some evil people there um, trying to commit spiritual anarchy. anarchy where they're trying to divide the church. They're trying to take a little bit of the Bible and put their own spin on it and then feed it to people. Paul mentioned in, in Corinthians where um, in, towards the end times that there will be people with itchy ears. In other words, there will be people that want to hear only the good things and nothing about the fire and the brimstone, nothing about the requirement to obey God or suffer the consequences. He's saying that there will be false teachers among the followers of them. In other words, there'll be people who claim to be believers, but their audio and video does not match. What they say and what they do will not align, and they will you'll be able to see that they're false teachers. See, false teachers, they, they sound plausible, but ultimately they have nothing to say that's from God, and they deceive other people and mislead other people. So we need to know who they are, and Paul is telling Titus, you need to sharply rebuke them. Paul emphasized the fact um, that, that many of them were be the Jews among them that would actually try to take people away from the truth of the gospel. And he referred to them as um, the circumcisions. And, and, and we know part of being a Jew at that time was you would be circumcised. And this circumcision is a part of being a Jew is a part of the law that you must uphold. But being in Christ is not about the law, it's about the grace that's bestowed upon us due to our, our faith in the Lord Jesus alone. So Paul commanded that Titus stop those false teachers because these false teachers will grow and will become urgent to oppose them. And, and the other part is one bad seed can spoil the bunch. So these people that question their faith um, could cause other people to regress in their walk with Christ. 
And then when we move to verse um, 12 there, Paul quoted another false prophet there in um, a, a Crichton prophet there, his own words. He said, this prophet called them liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons there. In fact, the name um, Cretan in the um, Greek language is synonymous with lying and lazy people, right? This was a reputation of that particular island. So Paul is saying, hey, look, they call themselves that. So note that there will be people like that among you. But we know that when we find Christ, we're new creatures. So Paul mentioned this testimony of this false teacher in this case is in fact true. Therefore, any and all teachings that oppose the gospel must be rebuked. The false teachers must be rebuked so that sound doctrine can reign in this island. Then our lesson then moved down to um, the second chapter in Titus, and we'll go chap um, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, which discussed being, being trained up in Christ by his saving grace. And it read, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace is what brings salvation. We don't, uh, we don't go out and get salvation. Salvation comes to us. We have an opportunity to receive salvation. Salvation is available to anyone. We just got to receive it. How do we do that? We're saved by faith through grace. God does not have a gospel of grace for some and the law of um, self-justification for others. No, all men uh, can find salvation through the grace of God. That is the only way. As Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Our lesson then moved down to chapter 2, verses 14 through 11, which discuss godly expected living. Um, it, it reads, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking to the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and salvation, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might rede that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and uh, purify for him his himself his own special people zealous for good work what we find here is Jesus trained us Jesus is a great teacher he instructed hundreds of thousands of people of how they should live his life is, an, is the example. The word even continued to guide us to this day as we read the word of God in the Bible. Jesus' very presence in us is to help us overcome sin and live righteous lives right now. We don't have to wait for eternity. We can put on the full armor of God, and part of that armor is the breastplate of righteousness right now. Therefore, we are to renounce ungodliness and worldly desires and instead pursue the, the sensible self-control righteousness and godliness that Christ has taught us. See, when a person comes to Christ, we have to renounce sin. And part of being Christ's disciples is recognizing evil and turning away from it, which we can, which can be a formula declaration to renounce sin and worldly passions. When we give our life to Christ, we're saying, I don't want that which is in the world. I want to turn away from sin. And now I want that which is in Christ. But the thing about this is more than this, this verbal declaration. It is a change in mindset. Making Christ Lord require us move, re removing the idols in our lives. These idols can be the people, places, and things. Yes, it's these nouns that, that, can, uh, that we worship that causes us to, to, to lean away from God. If we look at money more than God or our children or anyone else more than God, they're considered idols in our lives. And it, uh, we're required to remove those things, and God must be first. See, Christ has prioritized and taking first place in our hearts. That's what it means to be saved. 
We have to choose him over alcohol and money and reputation and worldly success. We have to choose him um, over uh, immoral pleasures and, and everything else that the world offers. We have to choose Christ first. And we have to do it daily. As the Bible tells us, we need to pick up our cross and follow him each day. In our final verse, verse 15, it states, speak these things, exalt and rebuke all authority. Let no one despise you. See, Titus was to speak continuously about the grace of God and its effect on godly's living. See, he was to urge people to orient themselves in the grace of God. Exaltation is to use doctrine to edify believers, creating strong Christians with the full grasp of grace. This is what we need to do as leaders and teachers. We need to make sure people understand that it's by the grace of God. There was nothing we could do. There's no works we could do, but by his grace, when we have put our faith in Christ, we are saved. We are required to teach that so they can understand. Now, on the other hand, while we are to teach those things, we should also rebuke or correct those who try to push the legalism, meaning that we're saved through, um, you know, the commandments and the other non-gospel agenda without being ashamed of it. We don't have to be ashamed to tell someone that if you put your faith in Buddha, if you put your faith in Confucius, if you put your faith in a Muhammad, you are absolutely wrong. We need not be ashamed of that because the Bible tells us that Jesus, again, is the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul is saying, as a pastor, we have the authority in the word of God and, and let no one put or uh, despise us, right? A pastor is to preach the word of God with authority. We are to teach the Bible as if it is God speaking when he clearly expound what God has said. When we, when we speak the word of God, if we don't add anything or take it away from the Bible, we are speaking the actual words of the father. And we are to do this boldly so people may hear. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.